Okay, welcome back for uh, our last discussion on Chapter 10, the Kinetic Theory. Um, this hopefully will be a bit uh, more of an abbreviated discussion than our previous three. We have a little bit of vocabulary to take care of today, and then we actually get to do some quantitative analysis. We get to do some math today uh, related to changes of phase. So first, let's define uh, the enthalpy of fusion. Enthalpy is also known as the heat of fusion. So the definition of this is the quantity of heat or energy, uh, and that will be measured today in joules. That's going to be our SI unit for energy or heat. So the quantity of heat required, so this is an endothermic process to change a solid to a liquid at its melting point. So once you reach the melting point, those solid particles need to be need to gain energy to be pulled away from those liquid par uh, from each other so they can slide past each other and become a liquid. Now the quantity of energy required to do that at the melting point is known as the enthalpy of fusion, abbreviated delta H sub FUS. Okay, now the enthalpy or heat of vaporization is similar. It's the quantity of heat, once again, in joules, our SI unit for heat, required to change a liquid to a gas. And this would be at its boiling point. So, liquid particles are still somewhat attracted to each other, and we need to, uh, to add enough energy to turn those liquid particles, which are attracted to each other, into gaseous particles, which have no attractive forces for each other. And that requires energy. The energy required to do that is called the enthalpy of vaporization, or delta H sub VAP. Now, Let's take a look at this graph. Uh, this is for water, and we're going to start out at negative 25 degrees Celsius. Now we know that water at negative 25 degrees Celsius is a solid. So we're going to add some heat. So let's pretend we have a beaker of ice, uh, and we place it on a ring stand, and we uh, put a Bunsen burner underneath it, and we're able to measure the heat that we add to that ice at negative 25. And to no one's surprise, as we add heat, the temperature rises. But then here at point B, the temperature stops rising, even though we're adding heat. Hmm, I wonder what's happening there. Well, for water, it's at zero degrees Celsius when this happens. We are changing phase. This energy from here to here is the heat of fusion. The energy required to melt that substance at its melting point, we're changing the phase from a solid to a liquid here. Now, once all the liquid particles have changed phase, excuse me, once all the solid particles have changed phase into a liquid, <clears throat> now any additional energy that we add goes into raising the temperature. So right here, we have the liquid phase. And that temperature continues to increase as we add more and more heat. And then at point D, you'll notice the temperature stops increasing again and we have a nice steady temperature as we are adding more and more heat until we get to point E. Well, what do you think is happening here? We're adding heat, but the temperature stays at 100 degrees Celsius. Once again, we're changing phase. This energy here, from here to here, is called our heat of vaporization. So we're taking those liquid particles and adding energy to separate them into gas particles, notice that the heat of vaporization for a substance is much larger than its heat of fusion. Then, once we reach point E, the energy that we add raises the temperature of the vapor. So right here, we have a gas. Now, when a substance is at its melting or boiling point, notice that adding more heat does not change the temperature until all of it is either melted or boiled then the temperature will begin to rise. So let's take a look at a couple of problems here. The first one, um, how much heat is needed to raise the temperature of 100 grams of tin from 20 to 80 Celsius? 
Now there's no phase change here. We're simply taking the metal from 20, a little bit below room temperature, to 80 Celsius. Now we're going to use a concept called specific heat. Specific heat by definition is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of something, in this case tin, by one degree Celsius. And we can look these values up in a handbook or in our case in the index in the back of our book. Appendix, excuse me, in the back of our book. So we have 100 grams of tin, that's the mass of tin, times, this is the specific heat of tin, SH, or often it's some symbolized by the letter C. And then 80 minus 20 is my delta T. The temperature goes from 20 to 80. So we just want to find the change in temperature here. So it's going to be the difference between the high and the low in this case. So this will equal the energy required for that process. Now the symbol for that is Q. So we have Q equals M times C times delta T. Sometimes these are referred to as M cat problems. So we multiply that out and round off to three significant figures. I end up with 1.32 times 10 to the third joules or 1.32 kilojoules. Now I showed you that because there was no change in phase, no change in state. It started as a solid, ended up as a solid in this temperature range. But what if a change of state or phase is involved? Let's take our example with water. What if I'm going from a very low temperature, below its normal freezing point, to a very high temperature, above its normal boiling point? Aren't we going to have the step that will involve heating the solid to its melting point, then melting it, then heating the liquid to its boiling point, then boiling it all, changing it from a liquid to a vapor, and then finally taking the vapor to its final temperature. We would have one, two, three, four, up to five steps involved in this process if we're going from a temperature below the freezing point to above the boiling point. So that's what this example is on the last page of your notes for this chapter. We are going to take 25 grams of ice and we're going to heat it from negative 55 Celsius to steam at 225. Now, of course, ice, water, at negative 55 is a solid. We are going to turn it into, at the end, a gas. Well, in between, we're going to end up with a liquid. So we're going to have the heat of fusion that we're going to have to add to this process, as well as the heat of vaporization. So there are going to be five steps to this problem. First of all, let's heat the ice to its melting point. So we're going to go from negative 55 degrees Celsius to, what's the normal melting point of water? Zero degrees Celsius. So we have 25 degrees Celsius, that's our mass, times the specific heat of ice, 2.06 joules, needed to raise the temperature of one gram of that substance by one degree Celsius, times my temperature change. Now I'm going from negative 55 to zero. Isn't my temperature change 55 degrees Celsius? Now I've done the math previous to this, and I actually rounded this off to three sig figs. I'm going to cheat a little bit and say that that's, well, 55.0. I'm going to give myself three significant figures in that calculation. Now, I have my ice at its melting point. What do I need to do to it next? Well, I need to melt it. So, that would be my heat of fusion. And the heat of fusion for ice is 334 joules need to be added to melt one gram of ice. So, 25 grams of ice times 334 joules required per gram ends up giving me 8,350 joules for that phase change. You'll notice there's no delta T involved because at the melting point, if we look at the graph on the previous page of my notes, does the temperature rise when I'm at my melting point? It does not. So there's no delta T here. Number three, now we're going to take the liquid and heat it up to its boiling point. So we still have 25 grams of ice. The specific heat, excuse me, 25 grams of liquid water now, not ice. So the specific heat is 4.18 joules needed to raise the temperature of one gram of liquid water by one degree Celsius. And it's at zero degrees Celsius and we're taking it to its boiling point, which is 100. So my delta T is 100 degrees Celsius that energy change 
is 10,500 joules. Now, I now have my liquid water at its boiling point. What's my next step? Well, I need to boil it all. I need to separate those liquid particles into gas particles, and that requires a lot of energy called the heat of vaporization. The heat of vaporization for water is 2260 joules for every gram I want to turn from a liquid into a vapor. So I have my 25 grams of liquid water times 2260 joules per gram. Once again, there's no temperature change at the boiling point or the melting point until it's all melted, or in this case, all boiled. The total here is 56,500 joules. Now please check my math on this. I've been known to make a mistake or two. But I got 56,500 rounded off to three sig figs. Now finally, I have some steam. And that steam's at 100 degrees Celsius. And we want to heat it up to, remember, 225 Celsius. So my delta T in this case will be from 100 to 225. Isn't that 125 degrees uh, of change? So, 25 grams of water, the specific heat of steam, 2.02 joules per gram degrees Celsius, times my delta T from 100 to my final temperature, which is 225, turns out to be 6,310 joules. So the total energy required to take my water from negative 55 ice to water steam at 225 will be the sum of each of these steps. Now, when I round this off, I have to be careful with my significant figures. You remember when I add, I look at the decimal place or to where the answer is rounded. In this case, it's rounded to the tens, tens, hundreds, hundreds, and tens. So I have to go with the least accurate, which is to the nearest hundred. So when I add these up, I get 84,490, but if I round to the nearest hundred, I'm going to round that off to 84,500 joules, which is the same as 84.5 kilojoules of energy for that process. Alrighty. Now, sometimes when you do these problems, you're not going to go from the solid to the vapor. You might only go from the solid to the liquid. So you're going to go to the, you're going to take it from its initial temperature to its melting point, whatever that is. You'll have to look that up. Then you'll need to add the heat of fusion, energy required to melt it, and then you would take it from its liquid to its final liquid temperature. In this case, we had five steps because we went through two phase changes, and each phase had a different specific heat. Alrighty, that's it for chapter 10 on the kinetic theory. I'm going to do assignment 31 for you next. Um, I'll help you through a few other problems. So thank you. Um, stay tuned. We'll be coming up with additional video lectures um, soon.